questions. So we've got about 15 or maybe 20 minutes for Q&A, so that people would just like to throw questions for the panel. Feel free. Uh, this is just a sort of general question. Um, I've been following the uh, crash course, uh, navigating digital information course, uh, quite closely actually. And uh, one of the things that John Green pointed out that I really liked was uh, this idea of lateral reading. So uh, the idea of making sure that you don't just scroll down blindly and that you sort of do your homework, look up those other sources, go to other links and things like that. Um, do you feel that all of his points in that particular series could be carried through into proper media literacy education or, or anything like that? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I actually helped with the series before that, the media literacy series. I, I disagree with lateral reading. Um, sorry to be controversial, but I disagree with fact-checking too. I, I, I've done research on people's digital literacy and media literacy practices and I thought my research was wrong because I studied grad students versus undergrads and the grad students didn't seem to be doing any of the, of the techniques we taught. Um, I interview parents when I'm talking to kids. Parents don't seem to be doing them and I thought there was something wrong with my questions. But we don't have time for that. And, 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 um, and this research is based on what professional fact checkers do and I, I I applaud the work um, in the sense that I'm glad that they're asking these questions. And I think, I don't know if Dave and I will disagree, but, um, but they're professional fact checkers. So what they're not, what's not being factored into applying those practices to everyday life is that professional fact checkers have an interest in fact checking. They have um, years of training and expertise in fact checking, um, and they have uh, a responsibility as far as their jobs go to fact checking, which are all things that we in everyday life don't necessarily have. So um, I agree, I find it interesting and I find it um, a very noble uh, bar to, to hold, but as far as realistically, we don't have time for everything we're reading to go and check the sources. So I'm so glad you brought that up because, um, yeah, I. I and that's, that's the challenge we have in media literacy education, is there's the ideals, and then there's the realities. And I think what we're trying to do is, is navigate what those realities are and how we can practice media literacy. Yeah, anyway. I would, and I would even just quickly add, not, and I agree 100%, I would even just quickly add that it's not that we don't have time, it's almost that we don't, it's not that, that we, don't, we don't interact with information that way anymore. Very good point. So it's not, the, the way that we're, we're consuming or interacting, engaging with information is much more, it's much more disrupted, distributed in any case. So it's kind of, what does it even mean to have the time to do that? When it's, you know, it's almost like when computers came up, you used to just write all your essays out of hand and then you got so comfortable with writing them on computers, it was very hard to go back and write them on hand. That's reminding me, we were in a conference together before and that's reminding me that of our, of our discussion that, um, our brains don't work that way. Once our brains decided to uh, accept something and trust something, we don't have that suspicion to trigger us to do the lateral reading or right. the fact checking. Right. You made that point that credibility is automated. Right. Yeah. So I think that gives the lie to the answer. Right. No, I mean, I think that was my point about the checklists, really. Mm -hmm. We can generate a checklist of all the things that we need to do, and yeah, that's probably very good behavior, but how realistic is it? I mean, how far do any of us you know, we might think that we are media literate. How, how far do any of us do that kind of thing? Um, I was a brand new media teacher as of last year, and every lesson I started, I was constantly surprised at where I thought the students would be at versus where they were at. Um, so, and, and I think most, most people in this room aren't digital natives, myself included. So I, I just have this instinct that, uh, well, definitely the new, the new media studies curriculum uh, starts by saying you must teach students the history of all these media forms. Uh, it was just torturous at points. And my instinct after having done it for a very short amount of time, much less than lots of people in this room, but was that uh, with digital natives, you have to just kind of facilitate them telling you 
what their experiences of it is because they are always going to be doing things that we have no idea about and uh, rather than kind of teaching them the history of this stuff and oh life used to be like this it's never going to be like that again do we just get on with it or do do they need that grounding do we need to say once there was tapes and then there was DVDs and then there was this <laughs> I, just, I, I, I agree on the point about agency, this idea that we somehow have to, you know, have to engage with what's going on and find ways of empowering people to do that, understand mm -hmm. they do have agency. I don't totally agree with it, but I think we do, um, and we have to reinvest a belief in that. Mm -hmm. but young people definitely operate in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. I really love what you said about that that we can learn from them, right? Because uh, they're experimenting so much and using different things. And I think that that's been a real shift in our thinking around media literacy just maybe in the past year. Um, in, in the US, as probably most of you are aware, we had the tragic shooting in Parkland um, a year ago. And what really astounded me was how the students took over their messaging and, and really understood the news cycle better than most and went on all platforms mm -hmm. to, to get a message across and have continued to do that and been consistently influential, um, which shows us that we, we, I think there was an assumption before then that, that maybe um, they weren't using the technology, the technology was using them. And I think that we're seeing a lot of promise there. And so that got me thinking, how does that media literacy education work? Because boy, are they amazing. And I think having that strong civics uh, training um, really made a difference. They, they, they were uh, members of debate teams, so they, they, they knew how to form an argument and argue their points. Yeah. So, so, so some of the okay. things we learned. I think we need to be very careful of the sentimental fantasy of the digital native, actually. People may be using this technology all the time, 24-7, that doesn't necessarily mean that they understand it and they understand it critically. And actually, I would say history is part of that critical understanding. I don't think you need to necessarily drag them by the hair through you know, the history from whenever, but actually, I think there are a lot of things that as a user, as a very skillful user of technology, actually you don't understand just by virtue of using that technology so let, let's let's be careful i mean i don't think it's i don't think it's either or i don't think it's they know everything and we know nothing nor do i think it's we know everything and they know nothing i think we actually need to look a bit harder at what they do know but also what they don't know but david what i'm saying is i think we assumed that that they knew a lot less and I think that they've taken lessons from the Kardashians and the YouTube influencers, and and, and they're using those. Yeah, but I'm also saying I think there's a danger of assuming that they know a lot more. Okay. Um, you mean that, that they might be using it critically, or that they, I would say that for everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for sure. The answer is right in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Well done. <laughs> can, can, I, can I just reframe the question and see if it helps? It's absolutely fabulous. Um, digital natives, do they have any premium? Because they're going to go disappear soon. The digital immigrants, are they? Do digital immigrants have any premium? Because soon they're going to... What do you mean that. premium? Sorry. Well, I don't know. Value. Is there something that they've got which, you know, is... is is going to be valuable to, to, to all these important things that they're talking about. So there was this, um, this study by, um, sorry if I'm getting his name wrong, David Nichols, um, who said that um, the people who were born before the internet have different ways of, of processing information in terms of like, um, in terms of putting them in a cognitive framework. I mean, this is what Monica knows more about this. She definitely does it more than I do. But uh, in the sense that um, because we grew up in a culture which was about sort of um, reading, deep reading, um, it's a different skill set. Yeah. I'm not saying it's, again, it's only a, a sort of mutually exclusive. Mm. 
but it's a different skill set and a different way of approaching information that is not necessarily better or worse, it's just different. Um, but it's got, it's, it's it, it probably will. I mean, I was, I was really struck by the point that people made, which is true, that older, which we know that older people are sharing more fake news than young people because, and I say this from like my own circle, where people are much more, much less skeptical about the stuff they read and they're much more likely, the older they are, to like sort of believe it and share it, um, which is interesting. Um, and I'm thinking like when in 20, 30 years time, like if I'm still around, like algorithms, I can hardly get my head around them, even though I'm like sort of trying to study this now. And in 20, 30 years time, it's gonna be so like beyond everything that I think I will be completely disempowered as an individual user. I mean, I think even the people who are running these businesses don't even, they can't even get their head around. Like Jamie Bartlett in his book says that Cambridge Analytica were confused about their own data points and how their models work. <laughs> they don't even know how they hack the election, basically, because it's that complicated. So, I mean, so it's, it's in, in imagine a few years' time, I think the older you are, the harder it's gonna be to just even understand what is going on. So there is a, that huge <coughs> gap difference. So that, that sort of, yeah. Building Me neither. Okay. Um, so, okay, so, agreed. Um, I, I, there, there was a recent study, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting um, who it was by. I think it's out of NYU, but I'm not 100% certain. Um, that found that uh, internet users uh, over the age of 55 were more likely to share uh, false information than yeah. younger users. But they were also more likely to comment on other people sharing false news, saying that they thought this was false news. So, so, Uncertain there, um, but to answer your question, um, isn't this isn't this like a human experience that, that we're always asking that question? What do the older generations um, ha have over you know? It's different. different. I'm not sure you can draw that line. It's okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. So it's different. I, I appreciate your thinking. Okay. Um, one of the things that emerged from presentations today was the notion of trust and mistrust in civic society, the institutions of state, various media, and <coughs> I was thinking about how um, the first book on this topic I read when I was an undergraduate, Glasgow Media Studies Project Group, publishing War and Peace News, really bad news, bad news, these publications that started questioning um, where news was coming from and the vested interest behind it. And I just wondered if that slide that we saw about growing mistrust or decreasing trust in the institutions of state is actually a good thing rather than perhaps the bad thing that we would hear in the media today. I just did a blog about this, so you should you should go and have a look because I think we need to be quite careful about those kind of global statistics, right? And in fact, when you look at them, the key thing you can look at is the Abelman Trust Barometer, which does it. And, and when you look at it, it goes up and down madly from one year to the next. And I wonder what is actually being measured here and how useful the measures are. I mean, I think there is a real, what I asked the well, it's a, it's a real question about actually how much trust do we need because there's a danger that there's a danger of too much distrust becoming dysfunctional that we all become cynical and alienated but on the other hand there's a danger of too much trust in that you know that, that we then place a sort of blind faith in the media or in other social institutions so it's I think we need to be quite careful about you know the these big kind of global pictures, really. Right. And, and, and certainly when you look at media, what you find is that people place their trust in, in different sources. It's not, you know, if you ask them, do you trust the media, you will get one kind of measure. But actually, if you ask them, well, do you trust this newspaper or this news source? Or, so you actually need to drill down quite a lot before you get anything that's particularly kind of meaningful or, or useful on that. 
So I think it's a really key issue, and it's a key question because people have been critical of media education on the grounds that it increases people's cynicism, distrust, or skip, you said, and I, I wrote it down, you know, being constantly skeptical is not an option. Well, that's what I wrote down anyway. And I, I think that's, that's right, and there is a danger there, but it's, it's where do we find a way through that? that it's, a, it's a really complex question. I don't, I don't have an answer, but we need to be, be asking. I worked at Tomorrow's Life. The only very quickly the thing, the thing I was going to say is like what, yeah. what I think is very worrying about this phenomenon isn't mistrust which is healthy and it should be there because we should be critically engaged with everything we see. My problem is with the more fundamental good files of an organized society, if you like, and I hope that doesn't sound too melodramatic, but when the people who produce fake news appropriate the term fake news, what they're doing is they're, they're eroding the, the core of our linguistic the language, which is our core of communication. So then words don't have any meaning. When you get 38 different um, conspiracy theories about the script that's being posing, the point isn't for you to believe one of them. The point is to not believe anybody anymore, ever. So the point isn't to like partake a particular view. The point is to like break down as an organized society. So I think it's not about trust as in I trust the government and it's all gonna be nice and, and rosy. It's all about, it's just about trusting our ability to coexist as a functioning society without sort of verging into totalitarianism. Yeah, let's take two more questions. Um, um, yeah. I wanted to ask a little bit about this disinformation and fake news report, um, which I haven't read all of, but I read the digital literacy bit. I just wonder if we're, um, I've got a bit of a concern, I guess, that a lot of the kind of research into this and discussion into this is around Facebook, which is a platform that most young people don't even engage with. So we're spending a lot of our time worrying about how to sort of tackled this problem on Facebook and a lot of discussion about news and as you say David you know most of the students that I've taught don't care about news so um, so one that uh, that's obviously a problem we're all nodding um, what what should we be looking at like if we want to be teaching digital literacy to sort of children and teenagers like what kind of spaces do we need to be occupying and and looking at to be able to do that, like, what do you, what do you think is the route into that? Are you asking me? <laughs> I mean, I looked, some, like, someone mentioned, like, a new platform, and I Googled it, and, like, my Google wouldn't even let me find out what this platform was, because it knows how old I am, and it knows that I probably shouldn't be on it. And this, it was this, <laughs> it was the... Well, that tells you something, doesn't it, about how the algorithm is well, the, working. the deputy editor of the Metro came to speak at the Media Magazine conference, and he mentioned this this platform to me on the phone, and I was like, oh, shit, I don't know that, Googled it, like, just could not Google it, it was a word that was like, kind of tilt or twist, and it just kept showing me, Twitch? Twitch, maybe, no, it's not Twitch, because that's the gaming thing, no, it's something I'd never heard of, I couldn't find it, when he mentioned it at the conference with sort of 16 to 19 year olds, there was a sort of ripple of recognition throughout the room, and I'm still there, like, Googling, like, what is this platform, and I, yeah. my phone won't even tell me, what it's it really is, difficult, like, isn't it? Because there's, there's a, you know, I'm a really old guy now. And the danger is that you're always several steps behind where these things are going. And we, yeah, we, yeah. Right, yeah, we think it might be TikTok. TikTok. Oh, yes, TikTok. it is TikTok. Yeah. Thank you, young people in the room. Unbelievable. TikTok should show up. Uh, uh, I have sort yeah. of like nursery age children, so it, what it just threw up was like lots of kind of nursery rhymes, learning to tell the time. Two kids and sort of. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's very educational, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. just oh. random videos <laughs> on there. But the point is, you know, I guess, I mean, you're right, and I think that the, the, the fact that that government report obsesses <coughs> about Facebook, actually, I think it's mainly because they tried to get Mark Zuckerberg to turn up and he, and he didn't, right? So they've got a real, yeah. they're very yeah. resentment of that. But, 
I think it, it's an indication of something broader, which is adults constantly kind of several steps behind, really. But what, what do you do about that? I mean, you are never going to be down with the kids. You know, that's, that's not going to happen. What you actually have to have is a, is a pedagogy that allows them to bring, is, it allows, it doesn't mean that you have to go on Google and find out what TikTok is. It means that your kids, your students, have to tell you what that is. So there needs to be a means for them to bring that knowledge to the to the table, rather than you being the person that, because you'll, you'll never be ahead of them. And I think that goes for media generally. Yeah. As far as uh, what to teach in the classroom, though, was that for the, like, how to do media? I, I think propaganda is a really good way in because we have the, hi the history of propaganda which is interesting enough to possibly keep people interested. Um, and then also current <laughs> examples of propaganda. People are smiling. Which examples do you want to use? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have some master students over here. So my master students doing propaganda work on Indonesian elections right now. If you want to say anything. Um. Uh, I would like to ask two questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 from the presentation, uh, I did not see uh, uh, about the topic uh, of your WhatsApp as the application. Um, instead of in our country, Indonesia, as the fourth largest population now, we are facing the national election a uh, month ahead in April, and we are uh, facing uh, this uh, problem also uh, with the fake circulation in WhatsApp. So yeah, I would so like to know your opinion and analysis about this because um, uh, I have uh, some friends that really intends to to to, to not, not to share, I mean to, to uh, analyze the, the the pattern of the circulating of the fake news. Uh, the the pattern uh, come first to the they, they they put the the fake news at the Instagram and then uh, they circulate the big circulation at the WhatsApp. And uh, maybe the conversation at the Twitter, not, but not uh, at a big portion. So uh, yeah, I would like to know about your opinion and also analysis about the, uh, how to handle the fake information or this information or whatever are the terms in the uh, platform of WhatsApp. So I think this is an incredible example of, of where our traditional ideas of media literacy fail. And, and part of that is because we have no idea I have no idea what you're seeing when you go on. We can go on the same apps and, and, and use the same search terms on other apps, and we're going to see different things. With, with, what's, with WhatsApp um, in the Brazilian elections and, and now in the Indonesian elections, we have no way of tracking all, all of the different ways in which this information is flowing. And so how on earth are, are we, from, from that level, supposed to make a difference? And so that's where it does become important that, that we ask the question, who am I trusting? What am I sharing? The problem is it's not your friends who are sharing it, bots who are sharing it. Um, they're creating accounts, right? And then, and then pinging your account, because I'm getting pinged. And, and um, how, so, so, it, so you, I 100% agree that this media literacy, this media, these media literacy issues are not an individual level responsibility. They are, they are like a global communal platform level. But at the individual level, that's where we're receiving the WhatsApp messages. So increasing awareness that, that the false information is happening is one step. But then again, if it's someone you trust, you're going to trust it. Um, we saw that with Brexit, right? There was so much misinformation happening. I hope, I'm sorry to even bring that up. Right? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But you guys mentioned Trump, so it's all yeah. over. <laughs> Anyways, it, I think the answer is we don't know, and, and, and it's so good that you're studying it because there, it's very difficult to study. I'm, I'm actually going to be in Indonesia in May uh, working with teams on this, so we can we talk after, but, um, but yes, it, it's too distributed, and, and we don't have models and frames yet for, for yeah. studying this. Yeah, I think what, what the challenge for media literacy is that we, we perhaps are still fixated on a model of text, of, of content, if you like. So when the government talks about regulating Facebook, it thinks of Facebook, it wants to argue, and I mean, I've made this argument myself, you know, Facebook is a publisher 
probably can think of Facebook in a, in a, you know, as a publisher that publishes content. <coughs> and we can get them to stop the bad content and only have good content or whatever. Whereas actually when you're talking about WhatsApp, the whole notion of like, you know, what is content, how you, would you even kind of identify, put a, put a ring around the content and say, Let, let's talk about that. I think what media literacy needs to understand in the context of, of a platform like that is actually how does the platform work? So how is stuff getting distributed? How does the, uh, the economics of it work? Um, you know, how do the algorithms work? How do certain things get sent to certain people and other things don't? How do filter bubbles work, etc., etc.? So it's much more, it's much less kind of fixated on text and saying, you know, is this reliable, is that reliable? <coughs> how do we check it? How do we tell the difference? It's actually much more about understanding the system and how the system works on the platform and how the platform works. And I think that is, that is a big shift in thinking in, in media literacy because we are a bit, what we've got from the older model is very text fixated. And this circles back actually to something Roman said about long form reading, um, that we had this assumption. I feel like it's an assumption that everyone was engaging in long form reading. I think that that's, I think that elites were engaging in long form reading, but I don't think that everyone was. Yeah. I know that, I know that certainly members of, of you know, my family weren't. And, um, and I'm sure quite a few people who have family members, who, families who, you know, who went to first generation college, um, weren't and so so the power of just like one line or two lines or gossip or rumor has been a pervasive issue yeah. in elections and in information for, for a long time we're seeing it exploited now in, in the technologies and that's something that we have to grapple with and i have one really yeah. quick final thought just bringing the mainstream media to the voice in a bit i think i meant to play the role of journalists here but is that thing that i think what where things have shifted is that mainstream media is always like the go-to because that was okay, it was trustworthy, and it was credible, and everyone could watch it, and they thought that they were watching the truth, or listening to the truth, and now that's not the case as well. And that's why we have this incredibly disruptive yeah. climate that we're all tussling with, because everyone's thrown back onto themselves, trying to find their way through, and we talked a lot about the platforms, but actually the other problem is mainstream media now as well. Yeah. Yeah, and that is profoundly disorienting. Yes, it really is. I mean, I say that very, very personally. Yeah. You know, the sources that I used to trust, BBC and The Guardian, I don't trust them anymore. And I, I wonder so where they... does that leave me? What do I do when I get up in the morning? No, I do not use Facebook. <laughs> no, I don't do that. That goes back to your disrupting norms idea. Yeah. That we, we don't, we can't, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to dive in because it's a good thing. We can talk about it all night, but my the free bar, my bar, <laughs> <laughs> the bar is open. Um, before we move on to have a glass of wine, uh, first of all, of course, I'd like to thank the speakers and discuss it. Embassy in London representative couldn't make it sadly, but the Media Education Association oh, chair okay. is here, and uh, as that organisation is paying for the wine, it's only fair that we give a plug yes. to the MEA. So, okay. John? Well, thank you. So, one minute plug, not to keep you from the wine. Uh, the Media Education Association, of which there are many executive members in the room Michelle's here, Simon, David, and uh, Jenny over there. You can find us uh, at the new website themea, or one word, .org.uk. We exist as a information conduit and support network for teachers uh, and educators in media, all different levels. This is alongside our day job. It's not a massive organisation. We have enough resource to buy some wine tonight. Um, <laughs> if you're interested in finding out more, come and speak to any of us this evening. And also, I'd like to publicise a meeting at the English and Media Centre in Islington on the 18th of May, Saturday afternoon. From two o'clock, we have our AGM, and we also have then a symposium where we're kind of working out what it is we do, why we do it, and I think educators are more needed than ever. It is not a Mickey Mouse subject, and uh, we also need a way of developing an open and inclusive pedagogy, and there's a couple of us that believe this should be from the very earliest years, not media studies, but media education throughout. Uh, and there'll also be wine 
dmea.org.uk and also on Facebook. And you're assuming that Palace won't get to the cup final? That's to be decided tomorrow. Thank you everybody. Help yourselves.